Yeah, we all right. I'm just, I got some anxiety, but we are packing these bags and getting ready to go to the studio. If y'all can just pray for us, please. We're praying. We're praying hard. We got you. God's got you. Always pray. Um, Army strong. Hey, we'll check in a little bit. Love you guys. Love you guys. Love you. Stay safe. Love you. Love you. Be safe. Um, speaking on the situation from Chino Hills and from... CPS reports say that it began when I was three months old, but I remember very clearly at four years old. It's the first time that somebody hurt me and I didn't have drugs. It was the first time I was awake and I knew what was going on. I was... I'm a babysitter's, and out of all the kids, she kept bringing her boyfriend around me. She kept telling me to come sit in the room on his lap, talk to him. And one day, I got really irritated that he kept trying to touch me, so I started fighting him, and she beat me. She beat me, and she told me, that he was going to do whatever he wanted to do anyway. So she locked me in the room. And when, when he stopped, she threw him, took my stuff, and she threw me outside in the driveway in Ritchie Canyon until my two biological sisters got off the school bus and they found me. I was in shock. I just, I just sat there. And the bruises were so bad. The pain was so bad, I didn't know what to do with myself. When I was 18 or about 18 or 19 years old, um, I started trying to look for answers. I started trying to, and I wasn't really, I know who my mom is. I don't need those answers. My former last name has, it means nothing to me. Um, I don't want anything from it. I never have and I never will. Um, I couldn't wait to get rid of the name. But when I turned 18, 19, I started trying to, still filling those holes to my life that I'm still missing. Um, and I tried to go back to the hospital, uh, St. Bernardine's, California. I tried to go back and get some type of history. Um, I started talking to my babysitter. It was a weird situation because she was placed in my life as someone that I started talking to in a, in a relationship type way. I didn't know who she was. I didn't remember her. Okay. All right. Well, you know, I don't know where to throw this. Quit playing with yourself. That stopped a while ago, but you know, here we go. <laughs> I don't know where, to, I can't, I can't. I, I, would, I would toss, I can't see anything. So, you know, I'm just gonna get low because I don't think that I can see you. When I went over to her house, I eventually found out things started coming back. We talked, we fought, um, we fought. And she told me that I didn't understand what was going on, that there were many, um, many answers that I was missing, which already there's many holes to my story, um, to the things that I know myself. Um, I wanted to, I stopped looking for those answers when I was adopted, but 
and I don't need those answers, but I, I tried to look anyways. Um, I went back to St. Bernardine's Hospital. Um, I started looking for answers and I didn't know what I was looking for. I didn't know if I wanted that answer. Uh, I have my mom and I know who my mother is. Um, Shelly Carter, I know who my mother is, but I just wanted answers. And she kept telling me she would give them to me and she lied once again. Um, everybody thinks that it's your elite predators, um, your celebrities, your blue check mark, your political suits, your very credible people that you're supposed to be scared of, or you think that that's the only people that are um, involved in corruption like Child Protective Services or secret societies, military and government corruption, you think that that's it, and it's not. And that's what they want you to think. They know that you don't know. But it's not just your elite celebrities, it's your everyday people, it's your lawyers, your doctors, your pediatricians that you take your children to, your everyday neighbor, your teachers, your daycare facilitators. My babysitter had the keys to the elementary schools in her area. My surrogate, I don't call her a mother, but my surrogate, she took her to court. She, she went to court with it and she lost the case. Um, and then I wondered, what did I do? What did I do wrong? Why did everybody treat me like I did something wrong at four years old? Why did everybody treat me like it was my fault? In the courtroom. They made her shake her purse out and give her the last bit of change that she had in her wallet because she said she didn't give her the rest of the money for that day. And she did. And then she took me home and beat me because she lost the case. Uh, everything became something that was normal since that day. That day, that day never leaves me. And ever since that day, I thought everything that was going on was something that had to happen and something I did. So I stayed quiet until, until I was about 12. And then every boyfriend, every piece of authority, Everyone that she brought in my life, she kept telling me she didn't get enough money from me. She got uh, government money for the rest of her kids. She stole Social Security cards. She was very well invested with the Panthers until they left her alone for a little bit. And so she had to figure out the money and then come by herself. So bootleg movies fake IDs, drugs, is what she did. But she always said she never got enough money from me. So, and at 12 years old, she started dating the chief of police. Hi, my name is Allison Carter. I have a cop pulling me over. I just want to know that if, if he's ran my license plate, I just wanted to make sure. Um, I just don't feel safe. I just wanted to make sure he ran my license Dude, plate. You just scared the fucking shit out of me. No, I'm not trying to do that. You were following me for um, a long time. We were, I slowed my ass way down. We and you are. Um, way down. You scared the fucking shit out of me. Calm down, right mom. Now. It's okay. Calm he's down. he just uh, he's he really scared us. He's been following us for a while. Here. You went over that, um, that solid white line. Okay. Now, I, didn't know if you were I am, I am going towards 366. Because I was trying to see if you were fucking following me, dude. Okay. You have driver's license on your equipment? Yeah. Is this your car? Um, no, we're not driving. Hang on one second. Did you call us? Did you call us in, sir? I just want to make sure you called us in. 
And I'm on the phone with 911 right now. I just want to make sure you called this in. Called what in? Called this just in. Pulled over. He's what are you, a state trooper? Yeah. Yes, he's a state trooper. My are you Officer McDaniel? We get fucked with a lot. Are so you I'm... Officer McDaniels? No. He's not Officer McDaniels, ma'am. Okay. We are on the road. We have had um, I'm stepping out of my car with my hands up because I just, I just, I'm not sure. I'm just stepping out of my car with my hands up. My grandma's sitting here in the car. We have been pulled over once again. I have already called 911. Please screen record this video because it makes no sense. This officer has now pulled us over and has said that the reason why he pulled us over, please stay on Facebook screen record, make sure with my mom. She's on my Facebook blog right now and she's inside this trooper's car. He has tailed us for over 10 or more minutes. We thought someone was following us, which he was. She speed up, she slowed down. We did everything that we needed to do to make sure that he was following us. Now he's saying that she committed some type of traffic stops or traffic violations. Now he's saying that she's drunk. <laughs> my mother does not drink. I put that on everything that I love and my grandmother's grave that my grand my mother does not drink or do any type of drugs. So he's going to run his test or say that he's on doing a sobriety test or whatever. I'm just done with this. I've already called 911 and checked with Highway Patrol. They said that he did not call it into state, but he did call it into Highway Patrol a few minutes ago into the car. Were you a cock blogger? I'm not going to let you walk up next to him. No. Uh, no. <laughs> you guys are ass wads. You guys fucking suck. All the brotherhood. Can you grab me a soda while you're back there? You're really harassing me because first you're going to uh, a violation and then you're and then I'm a drunk driver and then now you're getting me on drugs and shit and you're upset because I didn't pull over immediately off the uh, off ramp. What do my notes have to do with the drug stop or an alcohol stop or anything else? Nosy. Nosy ass. What does that have to do with anything? You're looking for what? What are you looking for? A lot of you saw the video where the police pulled us over the first time. Um, it was late at night. We, we turned the live live cameras on, uh, and then you saw us get really belligerent uh, with the police. Uh, they searched our car, they pulled everything out. Um, what you don't understand is there's so many more things that go on uh, for survivors. Uh, <clears throat> weeks prior to that, one of Allie's handlers had bought onto her contract. Um, <clears throat> that means that they paid money uh, for each one of those police officers to pull us over the way they did, uh, and I already knew that. Um, your, your police officers are not all good and they're not all bad, but there are some that um, have sworn to the Blue Ma uh, the Freemason uh, Brotherhood, uh, and they're very corrupt. Uh, like the, all the secret societies, um, they do what they're told to do. Um, <clears throat> when you saw Ali getting very belligerent uh, with the police officer, it's because the police officer was looking at uh, the phone. One of our um, one of the people that help us stay out of the way, um, was calling and we didn't want him to see who was calling because we were afraid that he would harass her. So, uh, it was actually, uh, Allie's alter Maddie that was uh, getting very belligerent. Most of you don't understand how things work for survivors. There's just a lot to it. When they paid to gang stalk her in that way, uh, the purpose of it was to stress her out to the point where she split. That night when you watched us on uh, the live being pulled over, uh, that was enough stress for Allie to split. And that was the goal of the gang stalking. What does it mean to split? Um, for survivors, for MK Ultra, they start uh, splitting the psyche when they're infants and it's called trauma-based mind control. 
and they introduce trauma into the, the children, usually the infants. Sometimes they do it while they're in the womb. Um, they can shock them in the womb. They can, um, there's survivors that I know that were uh, raped as they were being born breech. They raped them half in the canal and half out of the canal um, to cause a split, to cause enough trauma uh, for their, their blood pressure and their heartbeat to raise so high from the fear and from the pain that their psyche will split. Uh, they're looking for that split because they can pro program that part to be a slave. Uh, <clears throat> your black slavery uh, was more of a physical slavery. They were physically um, bound to where they were. They, they couldn't leave. They were physically in slavery. Uh, MK Ultra slavery is a slavery of your mind. You have no control over your mind anymore. Somebody else is able to control that. Uh, somebody else is able to say codes, passwords, triggers, uh, and pull up whichever altar they want to do whatever task they want. Uh, so it is the most evil form of slavery that you can imagine. And he would come in my room at four o'clock in the morning, every night like clockwork. He was a married man and he didn't come over during the day except for maybe twice. And, but he would, he would come over at 4 a.m., 3 a.m. to have sex with her and then she would go get in the shower. And then he'd come to my room. And there was, there was only a few times where I was, um, I was, I was raped in my own closet in Reno Valley, California, off of Sagebrush Court, off of Nason Street, in the townhomes right across from the high school. It was too many times in my own closet. And I started to run. I had enough. And he would have his friends come pick me up. And they would, they would, uh, they would take me um, over on Marino Beach Drive, right in front of the car dealerships. They would have their way. And then they would take me back home. Until they got a trap house on Nason Street, they would bring other kids. Nobody questions the cops. Nobody questions why their cars are parked the wrong way. Nobody questions what they're doing. Everybody thinks that if, if the cops are sitting in a weird spot in the middle of a deserted field, then somebody did something wrong and they were probably trying to catch them. And no. It's not true. I, I tried. I tried to run. I tried to scream. I tried to fight. And they would just put handcuffs on me. And, and then I had enough. I tried to kill myself. Well, my career in law enforcement, I actually joined the Brotherhood of Freemasons. Uh, okay. Yeah, how'd Lodge. you get into that? How'd you get into that? Man, you know, a lot of cops are involved with that. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. And it is, it's uh, it's a thing that I'm not saying you must do, but 95% mm -hmm. of them do. One of my uh, supervisors, he was a lieutenant, um, pretty much came up to me and asked me, hey, you you want to join a club? And I'm like, what kind of club is it? You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Well, it's a Freemasons. I did my background, you know, uh, on them and did my research. And you yeah. sworn to secrecy. Yeah, you sworn never to divulge any information, but to always protect and help your fellow brother. That's wow. it. But see, if, if you start exposing them, they'll go after you. They'll go after your family. They'll try to kill you because the government is part of it. 
it's not only civilians. The government is in cahoots with these people. Right, right. And in every, there's sectors throughout the whole country that split apart. I, I don't know if it's northeast, south, and, and west, but they have witches that are in charge of these sectors and warlocks that are in charge of these sectors, and they pretty much monitor the 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 satanic. Um, you know, I'm going to use the satanic. Uh, you know. Um, members mm -hmm. and a lot of them are politicians heavily involved in witchcraft mm. and they have to do certain rituals or certain things in order for them to gain favor with the Rothschilds and then they send uh, orders of, of, of you know orders of doing things for the for, for that family Wow. you know they give them orders and and with those orders come money comes with it exactly. they're all demons they're all demon possessed they're vessels they're fleshly vessels that are uh, um, they are compartmentalized. They're, shra they're, they're, they're like shattered. They shatter their brains, and it's just it's like MK Ultra, right? They they use MK Ultra to um, break the minds of people, mm -hmm. and then they mold them the way that they want them to go. Wow, you know what I mean? Or satanic ritual abuse. That's that all comes together with uh, the Freemasons. I want you guys to think about your mental hospitals. Uh, a lot of your horror movies are based uh, around asylums, mental asylums. Um, most of us know that there was uh, tortures that went on in the mental, mental asylums, um, lobotomies, different types of things like that. Uh, those things are real. Um, a lot of your MK Ultra survivors have been through mental hospitals. Uh, a lot of them get put back into mental hospitals um, to reset their programming if it starts to break down. Uh, a lot of your survivors have been raped in mental hospitals. A lot of them have been put in uh, dental type chairs for programming and resetting purposes. Uh, most of the survivors that you come across are gonna be terrified of the dentist and that, there's a reason for that. Um, <clears throat> they use a lot of medications uh, for programming as well. Uh, for instance, your, your CPS kids will all be on different types of medication. Uh, you, if you go buy a medication and you pull out that pamphlet that comes with it, there's a big long thing with uh, risks and uh, side effects and those type of things. They have to test those medications on people and they test them on the people uh, that are in the mental hospitals. They test them on the children in uh, CPS care <clears throat> because they can. They can give them the medications and uh, find out the side effects and, and use them for experiments. So there's so many layers of things that are being done. Um, it, it, it's the, just the worst evil that you've ever seen. I went into mental hospitals. I was in solitary confinement because I fought back so hard because I started seeing the corruptness in the mental hospitals and that became my fault too. She was in the hospital when I was about seven or eight years old. I was going to Boniol Elementary in San Bernardino, California. I also went to Del Rosa Elementary in San Bernardino, California. But at the time that I was going to Boniol, she was put into Patton, the hospital for the criminally insane. I don't know why. And I don't remember. I remember some of it, but I don't remember a lot of it. But I had to go on visitation to Patton. Boniol Elementary sits on the same street, right next door, pretty much, to Patton Hospital. And they would, I would have to go visit her. And when I visited her, weird things happened. They would put me on a table 
and play that clown game with me. You know how you try to stab your hands um, and not miss with a knife? They would they would put me on a table and they would put food around me and they would stab at me. And I remember that. I was... I was 15 in the 10th grade. By the time I went into Child Protective Services, first I went to Riverside ETS and Chino Hills Mental Hospital. I was in Chino Hills for a month in a psych ward. Um... The nurses there in the psych ward had a system, and they knew that everybody was on medication so they could get away with things like sexual abuse, pictures, writing fake things in the chart but discussing it over someone's bed. And because they thought you were high and drugged, they didn't think you'd remember. But I wasn't supposed to be on medication. I was given medication, but I wasn't supposed to be on it. There was no reason. And one night I was awake when two nurses came in the room. Uh, My roommate had sliced her arm she sliced it from here down and they used to always have to change her bandages because she would try to reopen them at night and I never understood why she would scream and she would try to reopen them I'd wake up in pain and I didn't know why and then one day I didn't take my medicine And the nurses came in our room and they were talking over our bed about changing the charts. About nobody would believe the kids because they're already crazy. They took pictures after they took her clothes off. And when they came to my bed, I started fighting. They threw me in solitary confinement for a week. I wanted to die. I remember the social worker coming out and telling me that they were going to send me back to my biological mother. And I remember telling them that if Whatever happens, just know that I'm coming back in a body bag. Because I know that somebody is going to get a hold of me. And nobody wanted me to tell the truth. So, they put me in foster care. When Allie was put in in foster care, um, I was advocating for her and uh, I was reporting back and I was writing reports and turning in uh, reports to CPS um, based on the abuse that she was telling me that she was experiencing while in foster care. Um, At first, they embraced me and they were allowing me to have visitation with her. Um, When I started making too much, uh, too many waves, um, they turned everything back on me. They filed a court order uh, that said I was a predator uh, to Allie, and they were telling me that I was not allowed to have contact with her um, because they were trying to silence 
things and they were using that as a means to scare me. They never, CPS was in charge of Allie at that time. She was their responsibility. Uh, if they filed a court order that I was a predator or was harming her, uh, they should have pressed charges and they should have followed up on that and they never did. Um, shortly after that, Allie went missing uh, from CPS care. She was AWOL for over a year. Uh, after that year was up, they placed her with me. They said I was a good home and a good fit for her. Uh, and they allowed her to be placed in my home. Uh, <clears throat> those are two opposite things in a very short time. Um, but they do that to a lot of parents. That's a tactic they use uh, to silence people, um, to keep control of the situation, um, to get people to look the other way. Uh, CPS is very corrupt and it needs to be defunded. It's, it's very evil what they do. Um, <clears throat> they can remove children from any of your homes uh, for any reason. It, it, it's irrelevant whether you're a good parent or a bad parent. Uh, if CPS wants to traffic your kid, uh, they can come in and take your kid um, and you really won't have a leg to stand on. CPS has no checks and balances. They don't have any oversight. Um, the ombudsman of your state is supposed to be the checks and balances. Uh, but the ombudsman's usually corrupt as well. There's nobody that CPS answers to. Uh, they work with the Freemason Brotherhood police. Uh, when they come to your door, they can take your kid and they'll usually bring the police with them to do it. Uh, they work with corrupt judges that are also uh, Freemasons. When <clears throat> I was fighting for Allie when she was in CPS care, uh, I went to the ombudsman for help. The ombudsman took our information. We met face to face uh, in Riverside, California. When <clears throat> the ombudsman went back to Sacramento where she was from, told me to message her within a week. Uh, I did message her within a week and I didn't get a response. Um, shortly after that, I tried calling and she had retired. Uh, that's just how things work in a corrupt system. A social worker from the county came out and opened a case uh, for Allie. Um, the social workers had changed a couple times while she was at the shelter. Um, at one point, a new social worker came. Uh, in social work, they, they will dispatch uh, somebody to come out and uh, initially assess the kid uh, and take the paperwork, take the report. That's their job. When that part's done, then they hand that off to another social worker. So a new social worker will come out after that. Uh, there, there's a really high turnover rate of social workers for kids. Um, they, they change frequently. Uh, so the second social worker came out. Uh, by this time, Allie had, had a pretty thick folder. Um, they had information. I don't know where they, they got that information. Um, but that social worker was very prejudiced toward Allie. Uh, she had not met Allie yet. She had not spoken to her once. Um, but she told me and she told the other social worker, I mean the other counselor, uh, that Allie was oppositional defiant, uh, that she was a troubled child, uh, and she already basically had a opinion made up of who Allie was. Um, <clears throat> we <laughs> went back and forth with CPS um, when Allie left the runaway shelter, she was placed in a mental hospital. Uh, after that, she was placed in a foster home. Um, there was a lot of abuse going on in the foster homes. Uh, at that time, I had a good rapport with the social workers um, because I was advocating for Allie. Um, at one point, that changed. Um, they got very irritated that I kept um, reporting problems and um, making waves and making reports uh, because that was forcing them to move Allie to different homes. In a year's time, she was in 19 different homes and, and attended 19 different high schools. Um, so it wasn't too long before the social workers were not really happy with me, um, where they were allowing me to um, have visits with her. Um, so I could take her for a soda, take her for an ice cream, whatever. 
they stopped that um, and then they turned on me uh, said I was a predator tried to uh, they put it into a fake court order uh, that I was not allowed to contact her uh, but Ali kept contacting me telling me you know this is what's going on can you help me um, and I was I was bound by duty to do the right thing um, even though I was being threatened by CPS um, I chose to do the right thing The first home, I thought everything was going to be fine. I lived in a home in Fontana, California. And I lived with a 16-year-old boy, a mom, and a baby that was no more than a year or two old. Two foster sisters. And my two foster sisters ended up leaving. But one of them was having sex with the foster brother before she left. <clears throat> so when she left, I was the only one there. He started coming in my room. I called my mentor. I told her the truth. They moved me from that home. And from there, I lost count of how many foster homes and group homes I've been in. I went to 19 high schools in one year. Never stayed anywhere longer than two weeks. Never stayed anywhere longer than a month. My social workers knew what was happening. But instead of wanting to make an extra report or having to make an extra report, they just kept moving me. They wanted to collect the check because I was a high-risk kid. I was a high-risk kid for court. I was a high-risk kid for um, foster homes. And eventually, I ended up in group homes. I went from level five, which is basically like a foster home, to level 14, which is lockdown. You can't stand up or sit down without asking for permission. You can't go to the bathroom unless you ask for permission. You can't leave your room and you have medicine that you have to take no matter what. And then I met my pimps. And I started talking to someone online. And I thought that I met him and he was going to be my boyfriend and, and I'd have this relationship. 
and I was with him for a little bit. His name was Keith. He had, um, he was, he was everything somebody like me needed in a time where nobody gave a damn and everything that I owned was in a trash bag and moved from place to place to place. And he made me fake IDs. We met at the Stringers Bar in San Bernardino, California. From there, I thought it was okay. And we, we, spent, a, we spent maybe a, only a couple weeks together before one day I got nosy and I went into his wallet because something wasn't sitting right. And I knew he made fake IDs and I just wanted to check what else was really going on. And I found multiple, too many IDs of different last names from Keith Karvatsky, Keith Turner, Keith Harrison. And he found me looking through his stuff and he beat the hell out of me. He cracked my ribs. He put me in the hospital. And he told me that you, you're mine now. You're my property. You don't tell anybody else. And I did it. Um, I did what he said. And it, it went from little jobs in a car to elite jobs and elite parties orgies that were with celebrities the Getty Los Angeles Museum traveling to the Buckingham Palace military bases 